Thank you for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me back. Um, this is always an event that we look forward to because many of us come from different parts of the world where Armenians have been forced to live over the centuries. And coming back home and being able to share what we've learned from these far out places is among the greatest privileges an Armenian can have uh, wherever they live. And that's the way I approach our discussion today. Um, let me also congratulate FAST under the leadership of Armen Orujan, our CEO, for achieving the five-year milestone. I think the past 20 years that passed in those five years for Armen's life uh, uh, saw a lot of accomplishments. Uh, hard to believe that it, all this has been done in five years, and we look forward to much, much more. All right. Um, I'm going to still see if some, well, if it's annoying with those chairs on these slides, somebody may want to change move them, but if not, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, because we just heard from the Deputy Prime Minister uh, and because there is kind of a, a bit of a cloud over this meeting in the sense of the environment we're in and what's happening in the Armenian world, in the Armenian existence, I thought it would be um, insensitive of me to just start talking about biotechnology and machine learning without acknowledging the challenges, the existential challenges that we face. Um, you know, it's n challenges and threats are no, no strange thing to, to us. Um, when I say us, I mean as Armenian, but also as a startup entrepreneur. Um, we don't have the right to complain about the conditions. We choose to end up in these conditions where we're constantly surviving. But we have to be very realistic about what our challenges are, and that's where I want to start. And, and so, let me just kind of say, you know, challenges are things that, that should drive us, that should focus our minds and our resolve, and nothing more. If you look at the challenges that we face as a country, still very young in the development, there are many, many, many challenges. I've tried to take a shot at 2 o'clock this morning to come up with a few of them, so forgive any spelling errors. These are, I still make my own slides with some help, but this is mine. Um, I think that the combination of inadequate resources, an underdeveloped economy 30 years into its relative independence, a lack of institutional capacity, which we keep talking about, but has been very, very slow in trying to implement, and it always is, a tough geography. You don't get to choose your geography. You also don't get to choose your family. But the reality is we inherited a very, very tough geographic location. Neighbors, access to easy routes, have been very limited. We could dream of being in another place, but we are where our home has been long before all our neighbors showed up. Um, there continue to be, and it's not atypical, lots of political conflicts. A young, a young country has lots of different forces and different ideals, and we have many of them. Um, we now face immense regional insecurity, uh, and so much so that we live under a threat to our very sovereignty. I don't think any of us who lived in the diaspora when we heard about Armenia gaining its independence ever thought that we would be facing a threat to our sovereignty. And it has awakened in the diaspora across the world a serious, serious concern, which I think can be a force for good if it's properly channeled. And then finally, a lack of productive alliances. When you worry that you don't have sufficient alliances, it's too late. You build alliances when you don't need them. And I think that we're living in a time when we wish we had alliances, but five years from now, we're going to still wish we had alliances, so this is the time to forge these alliances. You might say, what does this have to do with anything I know anything about? And the answer is not much, except I feel like I have to share these thoughts and get it out of my system before I can tell you about what I really do. One more slide. And that is, if only we were the only country in the world those challenges would be already enough. But of course, these challenges are happening simultaneously with a world that is facing unprecedented intensity of challenges. I always worry, I just turned 60 a month ago, and it always feels like this year is the toughest year ever, or the best year ever, whatever. And so I always worry when saying it really feels like the toughest year globally that I've been alive on this planet for, but it really does. I wonder if you feel that way too. And we have to realize that those forces are making it even harder to address our own challenges. And I won't go through the list, but 
you know, there are unprecedented scales of wars around the world, pandemics, and I use the plural in, a, in an important way, uh, massive manipulation and brainwashing and alteration of people's belief systems that are going on thanks to nothing more than technology and social media, left completely unchecked. There is inequality and injustice rampantly. Uh, it's almost like a, a factor of entropy, and it makes it really, really too hard to operate in any collective way. That has led to tens of millions of refugees. Uh, inflation at a level that we haven't seen, at least in the last three decades, uh, and so forth. And of course, looming on top of all of us, it, and we can close our eyes and hope that we die before this really hits us, is climate change. And climate change, for those of you who still worry whether it's real or not or whether it's imminent or not, will be the governing topic that will drive most all political decisions, in my view, and economic decisions over the next decades. And so all of that makes the left column seem a little bit uh, uh, even more ominous. And we just have to realize we're global citizens. And we have to deal with that. All right. Now, with that in mind, what, what thoughts do I have to offer to you? Uh, not a whole lot on these things, although I'm happy to talk to you on the sidelines. Let me back up here. I'm trying to get control over these slides. Uh, as a transition slide, I thought I would use this quote from Martin Luther King, which I think is really important to keep in mind, especially uh, in the rain, as, as, as Andre was saying, which is that we must accept finite disappointment but never lose infinite hope. At the end of the day, our hope and our aspirations are uniquely ours. And if we lose that, then the battle is lost. And I hope everyone in this room has brought a lot of hope and a lot of vision for the future to put to task on what we're about to discuss. All right. So with that behind us, and again, sorry for starting on a heavy note, uh, let me kind of change gears and tell you a little bit about the world that I live in. And I have several of my colleagues with me today. I just want to acknowledge that a lot of the work I'm going to show is work they've contributed to. Avak Kahvejan, who's my partner, is here. Those of you who want to talk to somebody who's spent the last 25 years uh, innovating and building companies in the tech and biotech arenas, Avak Sir, you should get to know him. Armen Magurchan, who's a colleague working closely with me, uh, who's been in Armenia, but also now works with us in the US, uh, running a lot of our artificial intelligence activities, and then Rafi Afein, who's here as well, uh, on the younger generation running one of our very exciting companies. So uh, we're well represented as flagship pioneering in this conference. Now, uh, th this, this conference tries to pull together computer science and biotechnology, and, and it's always a big kind of gap between these. But the good news is at the end, I'll show you how these worlds are completely converging. But I think it's safe to say that we're living in an environment where the century, I think, in hindsight, will be looked at as very much the dawn of biology impacting humanity. Uh, it's ironic because biology enables humanity, but it's never been technologically used to, to, to the same way as computing in other fields have, and so it's exciting to see that happening today. I'm trying to figure out where I'm supposed to point this to. Okay, here we go. Um, and, and of course, the reach of biology is not simply vaccines and drugs, but it's really expanding through many, many aspects of the human condition, uh, including, of course, important diseases like cancer and aging. But beyond that, the health of the planet. I mean, the planet is a living organism. It's an ecosystem. All its constituents that are actually dynamic, pretty much, have to do with life. And we don't really understand it at the level of life, and we, don't, we can't control it at the level of life. So there's going to be a lot of the life science of the planet that will be engaged in climate. So that's a new frontier. Uh, and of course, pandemics and the like even bring more attention to what biology has to offer. Now, my company, Flagship Pioneering, is now 22 years old, and we're dedicated to creating entirely new platforms that go about solving the problems of five or 10 years from now. And if we're right, by the time the problem's alive, we will have some solutions for them. That's the way you should think about what we attempt to do. And I thought in two slides, I will just show you kind of what our mindset is like. Um, and by the way, let me interrupt what I'm saying by just telling those of you who have come to this conference before. In 2018, I gave 
a, a predecessor of this talk, and I used this exact same slide. So I'm repeating here. But also, if you were in that talk in 2018, you'll remember that I gave a fairly lengthy description of Moderna, which I'm very sure, looking at the audience, was the most boring thing they'd ever heard of. Because here I was at the Marriott Hotel, where the conference was, describing with great excitement this ground-changing, worth-changing technology. And everybody rolled their eyes and said, yeah, OK, yeah, right. Uh, so I can, and, and the irony is that we had presented more about Moderna in that conference, the Global Innovation Forum, ever than any conference outside of Armenia, because we just never talked about the company before. So I came here, and I thought, it's safe to talk about it here. Well, so the, some people in the room may remember that. So let me just say one quick thing about innovation, just to I mean, those of you who are thinking about this as a, as a field. You could think about innovation in the traditional way, which is simply drawn here. In gray is what's known and what exists. In the light blue around it is what we call adjacencies. Adjacencies are what's going to be invented next, what's going to be dreamt up next. And the reason it's next is because it's adjacent to the here and now. And I would argue that most capital and most human capital flows to occupying the light blue region. Most corporate innovation, most academic innovation, most venture capital innovation, all happens in this condensed space right around what's here and now. And people are trying to figure out where's the next opportunity because they'd like to attract resources. Now you might say, OK, well, why don't they go further out? And the answer is nobody will give them money to go further out because further out isn't so close that people can actually say, yeah, it's a great thing, let me give you money. Everybody says, whoa, I don't know if it's ever going to work, it's too far, I'll wait, etc." We specialize in the further out, what we call beyond adjacencies. And we don't do that recklessly. We do that because we actually don't think we have much to add to the light blue area. There are many smarter people, many well-financed uh, uh, people who can outcompete. But in the far out places, most people don't dare to go. And the reason I say all this is I'd like to kind of explain to you what we do when we get there. But before that, I just want to make a, a point about the most important faculty that we use in our day-to-day -day work, which is imagination. You might have thought it's science. It's Oh, it's, now I've lost my. Somebody is using the same computer to check their email. <laughs> or maybe this is AI. Here we go. All right. Join the meeting. OK. I probably am missing a meeting, so it <laughs> might be my computer. OK. So I just want to I just want to bring to your attention for a second this notion of imagination, right? I bet when you came here you weren't thinking about kind of science and technology as acts of imagination, but I want to convince you that if you want to be in this field of innovation, the thing you have to use in an integrated way with your skills of reasoning and knowledge and recall, etc., is imagination. And that that is well summarized by this, by this quote that if I could only read. This is, am I being tested, Armin? Is it, is it a connection or is this, is this our neighbors? What, what's going on here, Armin? <laughs> they heard the, the, the first part just arrived there. So, OK. Well, you know what? Let, let, me, let me keep going on. So, so the, po the point of this whole thing is, you know, when we are educated, we are taught to be right. We're taught to learn a field, become experts. Just ask yourself the question, how many times have you felt embarrassed by saying something that wasn't right? Right? In school, in work, in life, you're supposed to be right. But if you want to go beyond adjacencies, you're going to be wrong most of the time. That's called exploration. And the notion that you're willing to be an explorer and not willing to be wrong makes absolutely zero sense. And our, the faculty we most use to allow ourselves to dare to go to places that we're not certain is right is imagination. Right? Now, you might say, oh, I use my imagination all the time. But when do you use your imagination, unadulterated imagination, in writing code, in coming up with new experiments to do? That's the, that's the, the, the interesting and challenging part. So how do we do what we do? And if the slides catch up with me, that's great. Otherwise, I'll just do this without slides. The way we think about things is that you have to, if, if, if you look at any given space and you want to do something that is truly disruptive, and the example I'll give you in a second, of course, is one you know well in the case of Moderna. But if you want to do something truly disruptive, you have to start with making leaps of faith. Right? 
Now you might say, how could a scientist, entrepreneur, engineer come and talk about faith? And I'm going to compel you, especially since Armenians at least believe that they have a lot of faith, uh, this should be common to you. What is faith, right? Ask yourself, to, 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 if you had a definition of faith, what would it be? I'll give you a second, because the first time I thought of it, I was invited to give a talk like this at the Vatican exactly a year ago. And they wanted to learn about vaccines and science and how it mattered to humanity as a scientist. And I thought, what am I going to talk about? And it occurred to me that faith is a bond that we have. So faith is belief without facts. Belief of the unseen. That's what faith is. Now science is belief only in facts. So you are supposed to disbelieve that which there's no facts in. So you could imagine these two forces absolutely collide. Because on the one hand, you have people saying, if, you, if there's no fact, don't believe it. And on the other hand, you're saying, if there is fact, that's not faith. You have to not have the facts. I think that in innovation, there has to be a way to use imagination to carry out leaps of faith. What is a leap of faith? It's suspending the scientific rigor of saying, I'm only going to believe what exists. And for the time being, believing that something could exist. Something that your imagination can foresee. For example, in the case of Moderna in 2010, we imagined that there could be a substance you could put into the body of a patient or a subject and that their cells would receive an instruction, we didn't know how, and make any drug that we wanted. That was the imagination. It was blurry in the beginning. We had no actual way of doing it. We weren't reading papers. We weren't talking to experts. We weren't doing all the things that you're taught to do when you do startups. We were just saying, if we could have what we wanted, what would that look like? But once you make that leap of faith, that's not enough. Just because you could imagine it doesn't mean you can make it real. What you then have to do is to come backwards from that imagined state to the present and say, OK, if that's what I want, and am I really sure I want that, how do I get there from the present? So then you look at the world very differently because you have a point of view about what you're trying to create. Right? You have to envision what you want to create. So in our case, we said, okay, what are molecules that could easily tell the body what to make? Well, it's either going to be DNA or RNA, the way our cells work. We looked at both, and we realized that RNA is completely absent in any pharmaceutical development program. And we started wondering, why is RNA this neglected molecule in drug development? And that logic, backwards from the future, working backwards from where we want to end up, caused us to realize that RNA might actually be an ideal molecule. Ah, there we go. So it's caught up with me here. Let's see how this works. Not even well. OK, well, you know what? For those of you playing with the slides, you can put away the slides. I can do this without slides. Um, so just so that you can pay attention to me. Maybe can we tell them to turn off the slides because it's going to be distracting. Sorry, folks. Um, so RNA is this molecule that sits between DNA and proteins in the way life science works, the way our cells work. And so we started imagining, OK, why is nobody using RNA? We literally went and asked people, why don't you use RNA? This is now 2010. And they told us all the reasons. There were very good reasons, scientific, expert reasons. Turns out that when people took RNA and put it into cells in a dish, the cells went nuts. Why? Because they thought they're being infected by a virus. By the way, I won't ask you to raise your hand if any of you got COVID in this room. I'm sure most of you did. COVID is just RNA. COVID is a virus, is a life form that is RNA, ironically. And it sticks itself in your cells and it makes copies of itself and your cells rightly freak out. So when you stick a new piece of RNA, everybody thought your cells are going to freak out. Fine. The second thing is they said, how are you going to get it into your cells? RNA very quickly degrades. So that told us, OK, if we could hide the RNA from, from actually causing an immune reaction and package it in a way that can get into cells, at least we have a starting point. And with those propositions and no real good evidence, we set, us, we set to explore the space. This is 2010. By 2012, we had built some labs to, to experiment with this. And we could show that, you know what, there are ways to chemically hide the RNA from immune detection. There are ways to put particles, nanoparticles. And if I roll the clock forward, by 2020, we had built a platform that the world had never seen. Why? We spent $2 billion of private money actually putting into place all the digital infrastructure and the biology chemistry 
to do something that had never happened before. Now, we were a completely unknown company at the time because we were busy making drugs and vaccines, and these things take forever. So they take five, ten years, and we were busy doing this on our own. And suddenly, the pandemic hit. And the pandemic is what taught the world that this technology existed. Just like there's plenty of other technologies that a need in the world all of a sudden brings forward. And the result of all that was a brand new medicinal platform that was actually, if you go back to 2010, a purely imagined solution. That's a very unusual way to think about innovation. And I would argue that while you should follow the science, follow the rigor, of etc., nevertheless, allow yourself once in a while to just leap. Ask yourself, for example, one of the more recent projects we did is we asked ourselves, what if there are viruses in our body that we don't even know exist that are good for us? You might say, what would make you ask that question? The answer is, yeah, just it's a what if. It's, a, it's an imagination. It's a, you know, it's a whimsical thought. If you believe there are such viruses, you go look for them. If you go look for them, it turns out bioinformatically you can find suspicious looking DNA that looks like a virus, which we did, Avax team at Flagship did. And then you start saying, well, what are these viruses doing naturally? And if you follow that line of reasoning, you end up with the company now called Ring Therapeutics that has in fact begun to develop a whole new medicinal approach using a virus that exists in our body that is not dangerous for us, that's not pathogenic. Again, not something you would just stumble upon if you follow, purely follow the science. So why am I telling you all that? Well, one, I want to ex implore you to allow yourself to make these leaps of faith and then do the science to support it. In the remaining time, let me just talk a little bit about then AI and how it matters for all of this. I was going to show you some beautiful examples with some beautiful videos of what we've been able to do. But AI, as I mentioned in the 2019 talk, is a very disruptive force in not only commerce and in lots of other things, but also in science. Because AI has a, a, the ability to extract patterns where the human brain and even thousands of human brains and publications don't do well with that level of complexity. If you can make measurements enough to gather lots of data, and if you can let that data train models that represent the complexity, even if humans don't understand it, super important thing to keep in mind, even if humans don't understand it, you can make progress because you can use that algorithm to actually make forward predictions and see how close you get. We've been doing that in one of our companies, those of you who are interested in this field, called Generate Biomedicines, which has done something quite remarkable in our views, although we're obviously proud of it, so you can discount what I'm about to say. And that is we set out five years ago to figure out whether we could take proteins. Proteins are the molecules in our body that actually do most of the stuff that needs to be done. They bind, they degrade, they hold up, they do lots of things. Proteins that are all the way back coded by DNA. We wanted to basically figure out, for lack of a better description, the inverse function. In other words, if I show you a protein, tell me the DNA sequence that can make that protein, not just the protein at the sequence level, but what it does. So can we train a model that says, I want a protein that binds to this, and then it spits out a DNA sequence that does that. Now, if you're saying, okay, well, how, how tough is that? How tough could that be? Ask yourself this, this. If you take an average protein, it's 100 amino acids. Amino acids are the, are the, are the pearls that you string together to make a protein. It's 100. Average protein. Each amino acid, there's 20 versions of. So now that's 20 to the hundredth power of diversity. Those of you who are comparing that in complexity should know that there's 10 to the 82nd atoms estimated to be in our universe. 10 to the 82nd. We're now talking about 20 to the hundredth, which is a little more. So imagine that our proteins, the 100,000 proteins that are in our body, plus or minus, are a trivial representation of the complexity of actual protein space. So you might say, how in the world can you search 10 to the, uh, uh, sorry, 20 to the, to the hundredth power with life? And it's, that's a remarkable question in and of itself. We can talk about that offline. But the computer does have a way to actually learn, if you show enough instances, it turns out, of what it is to be an antibody that binds to here and not here, what it is to be an enzyme that can touch this substrate, not that. 
So machine learning has come a long, long way in our hands, certainly in others, to be able to do this, which is remarkable because that means we now can make computationally totally new proteins that can do functions that we don't have available in nature. You might say, well, wait a minute, is that safe? Is that you know, reliable? And the answer is that's where you have to do experimental work to prove that it's safe. But the fact that you can generate, that's the key word to remember, generative AI, we can generate novelty is truly a remarkable feat of AI. And I think that's the space that gets us very, very excited because you know, the life forms in this room and the plants outside and the animals and the bacteria actually are an incredibly tiny proportion of the life forms that could exist and the proteins that could exist and the DNA that could exist. And we can, particularly to help the planet's health and human health, begin to say, okay, are there better ways to be able to impact that health? So AI, machine learning, data generation and interpretation, all that coupled with the power of biology and life are the two areas that certainly we are occupying and FAST through much of the, the, the programs it's supporting is also trying to make sure grows into a great opportunity here. And I'll end with just telling you to let your imagination go a step further. What if we could actually teach algorithms what novelty is, right? So you might say, what does that mean? What's novelty? Well, what if you could show every piece of furniture that's ever been made, show it the sequence in which it was first brought out, and then predict what will be the next set of furniture designs that will actually exist three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. And before you tell yourself you could never do that, that is already being done. You could take paintings. You could take paintings, every single painting that Monet made. You could take every single painting, painting that Van Gogh made. And you can teach an algorithm basically to extract, even though humans don't know, and probably Monet didn't know, the essence of what made them do those paintings. But you can train a model. And then you can take an arbitrary painting and say, render it in the Monet style. And then I'll dare you to see if you could tell the difference. That's not an imagination. That's already being done. And in fact, we've taken that technology and applied it to biology so that we can take a protein and make it in the style of an antibody. Same idea, sh style shifting. So th there's just an endless set of things that are gonna be possible. Those of you who are getting your training, I'd say don't miss a chance to familiarize yourself with these tools. If they're intimidating to you, they shouldn't be because the beauty about computing is that it tries to make itself less and less uh, uh, necessary to be a computer science to use. That's the great thing about this field. Unlike biology, where you have to learn lots of crazy expressions and lots of detail, in, in, in computing, the best computing applications are ones that computer scientists aren't needed to use. And so you can count on that in whatever field you're in. And then let me kind of end. I think my time's up. Is that right, Armin? You can nod if I'm done now. I'm kind of winging it here. Uh, and then the last thing maybe I'll say is, you know, think artificial intelligence. I made this point last time. Artificial intelligence, I hate the term. It just happens to be around for 50 years including from an institution that I have close to my heart, which is MIT. And so that's not going to change. However, last time I was here, I argued it should be called augmented intelligence because at the end of the day, its usefulness to us is going to be augmenting intelligence. But increasingly, I'm of the view that what we should set out to do as our goal, as our goal is to have, in some way, AI represent Armenian intelligence. And what I mean by that is to embrace, to embrace the future, not the present. The, the present is really, really hard to compete with. The past, you know, often can be depressing. But boy, is Armenian intelligence of the future that really embraces AI going to be something to watch. If you're attracted by that future, you should make it happen. If you're intimidated by the future, figure out how to overcome that intimidation because it's going to happen anyway. Thank you very much.